Okay, folks, we're going to go with our next talk, which is from Jennifer Zink. Now, uh, Jennifer has, uh, is a researcher, writer, and speaker from the United States who specializes in the intersection of traditional genetic and genetic genealogy. She frequently speaks and presents workshops on topics including beginner and intermediate genealogy, genetic genealogy, using DNA for unknown parentage, and technology for genealogy. And it's the technology for the genealogy that Jennifer's going to be talking to us about today, because there are some very cool tools out there. And um, if you've got lots of spare time, you can actually start using them, and it'll give you hours of fun. <laughs> and I mean hours. So please give a warm welcome for Jen to Jennifer's page. Thank you, Maureen. I think perhaps it's more like a lifetime of fun. Um, but I'm, as are many of your speakers here today, I'm a member of the International Society of Genetic Genealogists. And um, just to pitch it, it is a free organization to join, and it's how many of us share and learn a lot of what we know today. So things that we use DNA for, and some of these tools, are to answer questions. Are these two individuals on the right, children, of this woman? Are they siblings? This is something I have learned with DNA. Uh, we link together generations and reunite families. This is some of the work that I do now. Um, I fell into it sort of accidentally, but it's, it's come to be a passion of mine. We have many individuals who don't know where they come from, and we can use DNA testing to figure out where they indeed did come from and put them back with their biological families. So before we get into the nitty-gritty, I want to talk about just some cautions when you are doing DNA testing. One of the most important things is to make sure that we get permission from the individuals that we're testing. To do otherwise is known as surreptitious DNA testing and it is illegal in many places and um, otherwise probably we need to consider the ethics of what we're doing and would you want someone to do this to you? So we do need to make sure that we have informed consent. Let the individual know what it is that you're asking them to test for. If it is a child, ensure that you have permission of the family and if the individual is deemed incompetent, you may want to get or you should probably get the permission of the caretaker. Um, another really important one is to expect the unexpected. I have an aunt who turned up not to be a full aunt several years ago when we first started with this autosomal DNA testing and it put me in quite a predicament. I did not know what to do. I was on the way to Thanksgiving dinner and saying to my husband, what am I going to do? How am I going to tell her this? I had to make up this whole story of other people who didn't match and go through the whole would you want to know and thankfully when we were alone she said could it tell you if my father's not my father and I said yes thank you for asking uh, it indeed it was quite heart-wrenching for me so now I start out saying if the results are not what you're expecting do you want to know and then it's off of my shoulders and we want to always get permission before sharing information about living people. In my presentation, you'll see a scarce amount of information about living individuals. And if you do, it's probably myself or one of my children. And I give my consent to put them in there. <laughs> Um, or my uncle, he's usually my guinea pig, but I don't think I stuck him out too much today. Uh, so I am a member of the Genetic Genealogy Standards Committee. Uh, these are not something that are law or that you have to follow, but again, those of us who have been through many of these tougher situations have gotten together and set down some things that if you read them may make your life a bit easier. Some suggestions such as the ones that I've started this presentation with for you today, and that's at www.geneticgenealogystandards.com. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how to contact a match. I get emails almost daily, and sometimes they'll say, hi, we're a DNA match, let's figure out how. And for me, that's a problem. I administer dozens and dozens of kits for myself, my family members, clients sometimes, so I don't know what they're writing about and I have to write back and I've found that most people say if you don't have a well-constructed email, 
you may not even get any response at all. A lot of people just don't bother to write back. So I'm going to give you some clues today, and this is going to hopefully really increase the percentage of uh, response that you get. So the first thing we want to include is the type of the match, whether it's a family finder test, an autosomal, such as an autosomal test, a Y-DNA, or a mitochondrial match. Um, you want to talk about the place where you match. Maybe you're an FTDNA match, or at Ancestry, or at GED match. Um, you want to start with maybe the primary place that you're going to outline for them. You can also note other places. I found that we match on GED match, but I see that you also match me on Ancestry. Um, and then you want to outline the kits that match. That's that important bit that I noted at the front. So we want to talk about this is a match between John Dolan and Bob Driscoll. My kit of John Dolan and your kit for John Driscoll. That way the person knows what you're writing about. There are many of us who administer and perhaps here you may take care of your own, your spouses, children, or others. So um, you also want to include any information about shared matches. For example, if you have other matches that match that individual and you want to let them know how. So you may say, you also match my maternal cousin Daniel, so our match might be on my mother's father's line. You want to let them know if you have some clues that might lead you to a particular branch of the tree. This is an enormous help, and when people include that kind of information, I certainly then want to go to greater lengths to help them figure out how we match. And then you want to include your family tree. So many of the times I'll write back, do you have a family tree? And they say no. I had a great one last night write back and I thought it's a really useful match from England and I said she took four months to write back and wrote, yeah, no, I think that we probably do have a match, but no, I don't have a tree. Okay. There's nothing I can do, so I just have to leave it be, and maybe in a few months I'll get around to writing back to her. But um, in autosomal DNA, it's important to note that locations are especially useful. If you list maybe the county where your family is from, things like that, where that specific match is, that's an enormous help because women change surnames, obviously, almost at every, every marriage event. So following a surname is not going to be as helpful with autosomal DNA. So the place often is very helpful. So this is the kind of tree that I like to send with mine. I simply made it in Excel. Um, I like color. So when you see my spreadsheets, they're often colorful. I mean, green Ireland and blue Connecticut. And you see the different lines. Mine also has some that are pink. That's for my own use, but that follows the X DNA inheritance pattern. So for me, I know if they have an X, they're going to be falling on one of those lines that's in pink. Um, certainly you can do yours however you like, but it is best to have, it's really nice to have something compact. When people try and share ancestry trees, it becomes cumbersome. I start getting emails that I don't want every time they update the tree. So it's really nice if you have something in whatever format is best for you to send out. And so then you'd have an example email. I know it's a little bit hard to read um, at that distance, but say your DNA match Matthew. We would head it up saying a family tree DNA match between John Dolan and Bob Driscoll. Uh, dear Matthew, I'm writing to you in regards to an autosomal DNA match at Family Tree DNA between my brother John Dolan and your kit for Bob Driscoll. I noticed that they share several matches in common, including a known cousin, Tom Dugan. Therefore, I suspect that this match may be from somewhere up the line of Myrtle Dugan. And then you can see Myrtle in the tree. Here. So they would know that we'd follow this branch. Please have a look at Myrtle's tree and let me know if any of the names or places have any connection to you. I look forward to hearing back from you. So uh, an email like, sometimes I also include a note if you want to be, I put this a lot actually, if you want to be of help but you don't understand, please write back anyway and I'll, I'll guide you through. I put that in there a lot because a lot of people don't write back because they don't know what to say. So I really do encourage the people, please write back even if you don't know what to say. Just let me know you're out there. Um, and that does open the door a lot and get me a lot more responses. So we're going to start with some of the tools at Family Tree DNA. When you log in, you can look at the middle section or you can do the left hand drop down, which I just tend to naturally do for some reason. <laughs> when you drop down there, you'll see your family finder matches and then you can go ahead into matches. When you get into matches, 
um, you have all of your matches, and fairly recently they instituted what they called buckets. So you have your maternal and your paternal sides, and then both, which is usually siblings. Um, how you get into those buckets changed like three days ago. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to show you in a few minutes, though. I've taken the time to make some new slides while, while I was here for you to show you how that works. In a few minutes, we'll go over that, how you get into those buckets. But you'll see that several of these have a blue tree here. That means that they have a family tree. Um, however, there seems to be a quirk lately, and sometimes you'll click on it, and there's only one person in the tree. So hopefully they'll work that out. Um, for those of us who spend many hours a day looking at these, it's a big time uh, drain. But Hopefully that'll change. I, I think I've figured out how it happens by using my children's kits. When someone adds you into their tree and connects you, it automatically gives you that tree. I forced it on my children's kits to see how that worked, and that seems to be what's happening. Um, but there are two ways to look at the tree. There's the family view, which is this view, and that gives you four generations. But just maybe... 10 days ago or so, they, they just really changed a lot of stuff since I've been traveling. So they wanted to make this a super duper challenge. So about 10 days ago, they changed the pedigree view, but I like this one a lot. It looks a lot nicer and it's a lot easier to see. So you have the family that you can see in this sort of manner. When you click on them, you can see further information about dates and locations. This you can upload through a GEDCOM file for yourself. Um, and hopefully encourage others to do so as well. Um, the other, and another tool that you're going to use um, is the chromosome browser. In the chromosome browser, you can see segments that match in common. So if you're in a person's kit, if this is my kit, I'm looking at it, and say the first two individuals, C who's orange and M who's blue, say I know that those are paternal matches to me. If I suddenly get a match with S who's green and I see that she's lining up in all these places, gee, that is very curious. So, um, but I can't right away assume she's automatically, and well, I guess with this much you probably could, but in most cases you can't assume that it's from the same side because they could just have things lining up. So what you can do is find out if they match each other. Um, the next thing you can do is download. This says download all matches in Excel. It's very small, but it's just above the chromosome browser. When you do that, it's going to download to your computer. You'll see a file um, that has your kit number, and it's an Excel spreadsheet. When you open it up, it's going to look like this. It's basically unformatted. It's a CSV file. You, this file has your kit your match name, and all of the information about the different chromosomes that match, where they start and end, and how many centimorgans, which is how we measure the length of our matching segments. And then um, you can get fancy and do whatever floats your boat with these. I like to add in all different kinds of information. I like to compare it to different cousins' kits and say, does this segment match this person, yes or no? And then I add in the ancestral couples and color code them because I like color cody stuff. My different kits at different companies are in different colors. So that's how I do it. You can do it however you like. And um, if you look online, uh, Jim Bartlett has many tutorials on this. He's really the master of spreadsheets and he keeps such great track. I think he's retired and he spends at least 40 hours a week on his spreadsheet for, for many years now. So um, it's a great example. But in this case, I have some notes and you can make whatever notes. And this is one way that you can keep track of your data. You want to look at each segment individually because when an individual matches you, they might match you in more ways than one. And I'm going to suggest that a lot of people match you in more ways than one, and we just don't yet recognize how actually interrelated we are. So the next thing you can do is the matrix. When you want to find out, say you had all those individuals, C and S and M, back on that other slide, and they 
um, all match in a similar place and you want to find out if they match each other, you can use this matrix tool. So even if you went, if you had these people in your spreadsheet and you could see, oh, they all match at the same place, you go ahead over to your matrix, you put those people in the matrix at Family Tree DNA, and you find out if they match each other. It's not definitive. Again, it can trick you, especially if they have more than one relation to each other, but it's a very good clue. And if the person isn't responding to you, it's really all you can do if they haven't uploaded to any third-party tools. So new this week, linked relationships. About three days ago, uh, I was having dinner with a colleague, and she said, Sarah, did you see the linked relationships? I said, no, I was in Disneyland yesterday. I did not see the linked relationships. Um, but yes, indeed, I went back and thought there are. Before we had all of the known relationships that we'd been putting in over time, they are gone from this page. They're still inside here, but they're gone from your main page, and in place of them, is this linked relationship column. So what happens is, when you go in, it's just yourself in the tree. And you have a match. In this case, there was only one person linked to this, and that was me, because this is one of my children's kits, and I, I hadn't done anything with it, so I had a fresh kit to make an example from. So what I did was take myself and click on that, and what happens? is this comes up. And I then click here on mother and confirm that. It also has a checkbox. Send an email to me about being added to the tree. So when you add the person to the tree, if I'm adding John Stewart to the tree and I leave that box, it will send him a note and it's going to let him know. Um, what happens once you add me, then it starts to construct the tree. You can also click on the top on tree map and it starts to build you a little diagram of what you have so far. And then um, this took about 14 or 15 hours to come, the email, so don't get worried if it doesn't happen right away. Um, that was done in the evening and the next morning at 11.40 an email came Jennifer Zink 4 added Jennifer Zink to their family tree on FamilyTreeDNA.com. Click here to see Jennifer Zink 4's tree now. So that encourages the person to then work with you and hopefully you'll hear some response back or see that they um, in turn added you back. And eventually um, we added on some more people and this is what it begins to look like. I have third and fourth cousins who I can't connect back because I don't have everybody tested along the way. I think, and again, it's only a couple of days, so I haven't been able to confirm this, but I think what I'll have to do is reload um, a GEDCOM file, including all those individuals, and I'll be able to add them back on this tree at that point. Um, so before, you have it like this, with just showing no paternal and no paternal match, no paternal and no maternal matches. And once you add those relationships, then it gives you the paternal and the maternal. So when you click on those links, you'll see which matches she received from her mother and which matches she received from her father and which matches are both, which in this case are siblings. Um, the last thing that I'm going to go through with you to do at Family Tree DNA is how to download your raw data. This is what you need in order to use those third-party tools. On your main page here, just on the right, it says download raw data. So you're going to go ahead and do that. And for this example, we're going to go ahead and show you what you would do if you're going to upload to GEDmatch. They like to have the concatenated file. I believe that they use build 36. You can upload the build 37 and they just convert it back. So I just habitually use the third 30, build 36 raw data. But you do need that combined file. And then you go ahead over to GEDmatch. And right there, once you sign up for an account, and it's free to sign up, you find the place where you add your file. You can use other tests as well, your ancestry tests, whatever you have. But in this case, we'll talk about Family Tree DNA. And all of the kits that you have managed there will be on the left-hand side. It's not like Family Tree DNA, where you can only have one login per account. On this one, you can administer as many kits as you want 
within your one account. Um, there are the tools, the general tools, which help you to analyze your data. There is also a section for genealogy where you'll upload your GEDCOMs. And then there are the Tier 1 utilities. These utilities um, require a small donation and they have some extra benefits. Um, so one of the most commonly used is the one-to-many matches. This is where you'd compare yourself or whatever kit you're working with to see who else in the database matches. The benefit of this is that um, people from all the different companies will upload here, so it's a combined space. You enter your kit number, it automatically defaults to seven. Um, if you are not yet experienced with it, I would stick to the seven. If you're working with a specific issue, you may upload it, you may uh, increase or decrease it, but leaving it with seven is, is a perfectly good place to start, and you display your results. What you get is a whole spreadsheet, that looks really bad up there, but what you get is a whole spreadsheet and it's going to give you um, the total centimorgans that you share and the kits are going to typically start, the three most common letters they're going to start with are a T, which means they have tested at Family Tree DNA, or an A, which means they have tested at Ancestry, or an M, which means they have tested with 23andMe. Those are the three most common that you will see. And it does give you an email and contact information so you can reach out. And most of the emails I get these days do tend to come from individuals at GEDmatch. And especially for people who have tested at Ancestry, where you cannot look at the actual segment data, it's really important to try and encourage your matches to upload to GEDmatch. And another, one of the, this is probably my personal favorite tool. I don't have time to go through all of them, so I had to just pick a few. Um, but I love to see people who match one or one of two, but I, I use it for both. And what it is, is essentially like shared matches. When you put this in, you put in both of the kit numbers. Again, you can leave it at seven if you're not trying to do something special. When it comes back, it's going to have three sections. The first section is going to be people who share with both kits. That is the one you're really going to be most interested in. And it's going to tell you how much DNA they share with each kit and their suspected distance from each kit. So this is a really, really useful bit of information because then you can try and find a group of people who may share a common ancestor. And this is really the only time when I suggest sending out mass emails. I'm not at all a fan of mass emails and I almost never respond to them when someone just takes the whole list and copies and pastes and says, hey, everybody matches me. I don't respond to those. But if you have a small group of people or whatever size group of people and they all share, I may then take a screenshot of that and say, look, all of us share this. I think this line comes from here. Does anybody have any information? Because those group processes may help us to indeed come to an answer a lot faster than we would as individuals when we all work together. Um, genome mate. This is another way that you can keep track of your data. This is not for the faint of heart, I don't think. Um, I, I've used it for a while. Uh, but what I did was make a fresh account and start from scratch to see how long it would take. Um, I'm very experienced with the different downloads and, and files that you need to construct one of these, and it took me eight hours to create the basic amount. So I just wanted to get that idea so that I can tell you how long. I then talked to another group of genealogists who'd been having a meeting, and one very adept genealogist who even works on some of the TV programs for genealogy, and he's a smart guy and pretty computer depth. He was on day three. <laughs> so, um, so, but once you get it started and once you learn it, it's really neat. Um, I think there's someone here sitting in the front row who uses it pretty routinely as I would use the, the spreadsheet. Uh, and what you can do is keep track of all of your information. Here is an example from chromosome 12. It also shows you the graphic of where they start and end and gives you the, the same information that I would use to keep track in a spreadsheet. 
and say you want to click on your relative Joe, um, you can do that and it would, you're able to then store a bunch of information about Joe. And you can also look specifically at the segments for Joe and see who has overlapping segments and who's in common. So it is a really, really useful way to keep all of your data together and organized. And there is, a, I think it's 211 pages, the user guide. It's more than 200 pages, but I'm going to give you a minute to write down this website in case you want it. It's HTTP colon backslash backslash download dot genomemate dot org backslash user guide dot PDF. And it is updated quite a bit. And it was, I checked last night to see how many pages it was as of last night. And it was, I think it was at 211 pages. And you must follow the directions. If, any, if you want to take a picture of this screen, that's, that's fine instead of writing it down. Um, but you need to follow those directions very specifically or plain old doesn't work. Because the first time I tried it, I had it uploaded. And why isn't this working? And I don't know what I did, so I just started all over again. But it works fine now. And it is really neat once you get it all together. Is everybody OK with that? Okay, so DNA GEDCOM, this is the one I probably, the third party tool that I use the most. The tool that I use the most is actually the DNA GEDCOM client tool, but they changed that after 8 p.m. last night, so I'm going to leave it at that, and I had to take that particular bit of slides out because I wasn't going to redo more slides. Um, I'd been all week just chasing all these changes, and everybody was kind of reacting to everybody and making updates, and then in the US, a whole bunch of websites crashed yesterday. So I'm going to just go over a couple of uh, other tools that we have here. We have the autosomal DNA segment analyzer. This one is pretty neat. Um, it, again, it gives you kind of the same thing as the spreadsheet, but it really gives you a kind of neat visual where you can see how everything is fitting together and how your groupings are working. So some people prefer to use this tool over the spreadsheet or over GenomeMate. So this is another different option that you have. And then JWorks. They have JWorks and they have KWorks. JWorks, the only difference is one is offline in a spreadsheet format and one is hosted online. So I'm just going to show you JWorks. Uh, this you install all the different information about the overlapping segments and they give you, again, full directions how to do this on the website. And again, key, follow the directions. For all these things, you just look at the directions and follow along. Um, and ultimately, what you get, uh, you have to download these specific three files they tell you. you. I had them in the cloud and it wasn't working that well. I put them resident on my own laptop and then put the file in there and it seemed to work smoother for me that way. So when you have all of the, all of the files together in the one folder, you click there to run JWorks. You go through a little bit. It asks you for your kit number and a couple other easy things. And what you get, again, is the groupings. So it's another way to look at those bits of shared data. There's also Kitty Cooper Segment Mapper. Uh, Kitty Cooper has several different tools. There's the Ancestor Chromosome Mapper. If you have a spreadsheet such as mine that I showed you before, and you have the column for the most recent common ancestor, um, you can go ahead and put it in here, and it will give you a colorful outline of which segments of your DNA came from which sets of ancestors. In my chart here, um, for instance, the, the, the dark blue is just grandparents, but some of them go as far as third great grandparents. These yellow bits are, are third great grandparents, so that's pretty neat. I got quite a bit of DNA from them. So, um, And then there's the overlapping segment mapper. Again, there are instructions, and on Kitty's blog, she suggests that you sort by your largest segments, and then it will give you the top 40, and it shows how things overlap. 
And then a lot of times you want to look at just one segment. So um, she has also a one segment mapper. And this is kind of neat because you can see where the people are overlapping and grouping on that specific <laughs> segment in a very, very detailed way. And DNA land. DNA land is probably the newest one that we have. They operate out of the New York Genome Center um, is where they are having their business now. And they are working on quite a bit of research. A few of us went to their office and learned some neat things. They worked with a girl with a craniofacial deformity and they tracked people in the US who were related to her and they narrowed down which mutation eventually was causing it. So they were able to actually find out why this girl and members of her family had this pretty severe disease, inherited disease. So they have four different tools that they're offering at this time. They have the find the relatives, the relatives of relatives, the ancestry report, and then new this week, the trait prediction report. See the trend, everybody did something new this week, really made it challenging. Um, so what you get when, you D, when your DNA relationship matches come up, is a comparison. It has the name of your match and then it has recent matches and it also has ancient matches. We inquired to ask what the ancient meant but we didn't really get an answer on that. So, um, but I suspect it's, you know, not, not anything recent and they may be things that they are, um, other people I think would probably call speculative. So for me, I have four matches. But I noticed that they really only represent three different individuals. Um, two of them are the same person. So, um, but those are considered high certainty matches. And it is a much smaller database because people have just started using it. They also have um, their relatives of relatives. And I think they're calling that degrees of relationship. So if I'm related to the next person and that person is related to the next person, they're kind of tying it in that way. The second degree person wouldn't be a strong enough relationship on their own to me, but because we have sort of a linked individual in between, that puts us back together. And then they offer the ancestry report, uh, which is like the My Origins on Family Tree DNA. It's just sort of a run of the mill ethnicity predictor. And then they have the ancestry map and especially if you're Irish, you're probably going to turn up like me. We're really always end up in this little boring kind of spot where you're just European. So I'm very European. So that is what I get. And then they have, this is the one that's new this week. There's a trait prediction consent form. Um, and because they are academic researchers, they really make sure that all of Everything is, the I's are dotted and in order for this. They want to tell you that, um, you know, your wellness is a combination of genetics and your environment and that we're using SNPs to predict these traits. But they're very clear to say that they're just at the beginnings of this. Um, those of us who have been using this over the past week or 10 days have found that in some ways they may be accurate, but they still have some work to do. But they're not telling us otherwise. They're, they're very upfront that they're using this to learn. So what happens is um, after you do, you give the consent, you understand that it's for educational research purposes and it's not a medical test. And I realize that trait predictions usually report only a small fraction of the genetic predisposition and are error prone. The reports ignore environment, dietary, microbial, medical history, lifestyle factors, any or all of which may affect my true risk for any trait or disease. Before we came into the room, several of us were talking about eye color predictions that they do. They're still working on it. And Yaniv, the, the man who's the head of the project, does say they're only using a few of the markers. And GEDmatch is using something like more than 40, 41 or so different markers. So they may get there. But if you're interested to participate, it seems like a pretty neat thing to do. So if you agree, then you just go ahead and click your I agree. 
And the trade predictions they have right now are two. They're going to add more. They let us know they were just starting with these two. The two are educational attainment and eye color. So what happens is first you have, they ask you questions. How many years did you go to school? For me, it was 19. They predicted 14.6. Many of us who were genetic genealogists seem to have a fair number of years of education. And I noticed that a lot of us seem to predict in the 14 point something range. So, uh, right, I, I mean, most of, the, most of the people that I looked at did come out in the 14 range, even medical doctors and such who had even more education. So, um, but they're working on it. So we'll see how that goes in time. And you can make your decision whether you want to participate. I think if we don't try, we don't learn things, and I would never begrudge somebody who didn't get it correct the first time, especially if they said, we're trying. But we know it's not quite there yet, but we're working on it. So the other one that you do is eye color, and I'm way over on the blue side, and that part they got right for me. Some of them they haven't gotten quite right yet. Um, I think we have some, some peers who have brown eyes that were predicted blue or vice versa, and the, the greens haven't quite worked out yet. But that is what we have, and I did have to cut out some parts that changed last night because I was not going to change my slides again, but that's okay because we'll get everything back on track. Um, do we take questions, or do you guys know? Yeah. <laughs> is it on? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any questions? Have you come across any good tools for um, analyzing Y DNA? This is all AG this, DNA. This is all autosomal DNA. Um, for Y DNA, my number one suggestion is always to join the projects. Join your surname project and join your haplogroup project, also if there's a location project. Um, I personally started out years ago testing my uncle, who's a Dolan, my mother's brother, um, and I wanted to find out where my grandfather's father came from. I, as a little girl, heard my grandfather went from Ireland to England to marry my mother, and that's the end of that story. So how did he get there, and where did he come from? I don't know, there were a lot of James Dolans. So I started with the basic test. Someone contacted me from one of the projects I had joined and said, hey, we think you might be a D of 21, so um, can we get permission to, to do this test, the SNP test? So I agreed, and then I got kind of hooked on it and added on and added on, and eventually we found out that he is one of the families of the seven sets of leash, and, how, and that's how I learned a lot of Y-DNA, was working with the project administrators. Nobody knows their specific haplogroup and all the subgroups like the project administrators. That's their passion. That's their area of expertise. So even when I take a client, we always defer to the haplogroup administrator or the surname administrator. But even when I administer surnames, I still defer to the haplogroup administrators. Any other questions for Jennifer? <laughs> We're back on track. Well done, you. Um, I'm going to applaud you. you for getting us back on track. Thank you, you so I much, Jennifer. <laughs>